This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Almost everyone watching this program knows someone close to them who's in a battle with cancer. Well, the church historically has been linked with health care, as you see Methodist, Presbyterian, Catholic hospitals everywhere you travel. But today, churches are less involved in health care for many reasons. Today's guest says every church should have a cancer ministry. Percy McCray has been a minister in Cancer Treatment Centers of America, and he's helped develop a program that any local church can launch helping those battling cancer. Your whole family had been in ministry at one time or another, and you were practically born on the ch on church steps, but God's calling to you was not to pastor a church. Well, as it turned out, you're exactly right. On my mother's side of the family, I'm a third generation uh, minister. That entire portion of my family basically uh, ran and cultivated uh, a local church on the far south side of Chicago. And uh, at around 15 years of age, um, I felt the call to ministry, and I truly thought that that was to the pastorate. Uh, ran and avoided that for many years. <laughs> Uh, dodged God, if you will, and around at the age of 28, finally uh, relinquished my will and said, okay, I'll do what you're calling me to do. Went to Bible college, graduated, and uh, lo and behold, someone came and asked me would I be willing to work inside of a healthcare organization and do chaplaincy. And over 20 years ago, that wasn't a very prominent or well-known type of ministry mm -hmm. that many people were aware of. And almost missed the will of God because I really thought that I was going to pastor church and so uh, decided to work at the Cancer Treatment Centers of America and here I am over 20, uh, going on my 25th year now. Now does it feel like ministry to you today? Oh absolutely, <laughs> it, felt like, it felt like ministry to me pr very quickly actually, mm -hmm. it, it, it didn't take me very long, it was just a matter of, of, of a paradigm shift and it, if I can make this point, you know, particularly 20 plus years ago, many people thought that ministry only really took place behind a pulpit inside mm -hmm. of, of four walls and under a steeple. And of course, today, I think we have a much more expanded idea and concept of what ministry is. But uh, yeah, very quickly, I realized that this was no question God's calling upon my life. Well, you, you just mentioned that churches need to understand that uh, there's an expansion in this ministry. But you realized kind of early in that there was a deficit, that there was really kind of a void in, uh, in churches being involved in this kind of a ministry, that they were leaving it to the chaplain. As much as the, the, the lay people sitting in the pew leave the, the ministry to the, the pastor, the church was kind of leaving the, 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 the whole area of chaplaincy and, and ministry to the, to the sick to the chaplains. Well, you're in the hospital, you go do it. Uh, but you, you saw that void and you thought something's got to be done. We've got we to bring the churches into this. Correct. There, there was just a void, and it was really because of the lack of understanding and fear, particularly around the subject of cancer, that many people on some level just simply wanted to avoid and evade altogether because of lack of knowledge and insight. And uh, through a couple of serendipitous type of moments and experiences, uh, the Lord spoke to me and said, listen, there is a deficit in, in, the, in the faith community, and I want you to feel that. And so we started a, an outreach called Our Journey of Hope, which is a free cancer care leadership training program, uh, now well over 16 years of age, where we have ministered literally to over uh, 2,000 churches in and out of the United States of America on how to start cancer care ministries inside of their local church. You, you think that... Uh... Uh, maybe the, the, the hesitancy was, you mentioned the fear of the C word, cancer, that uh, back in the day, people said, okay, you've got cancer, uh, goodbye, you're going to die, let's get the casket ready. And they're just afraid that, I don't know what to say to somebody who's, who's just been diagnosed as cancer. You think that fear was part of what kept the church back from, from some of that? Absolutely. There's no question about it. Number one, you used the best example and analogy of the, of the internalization of what people had referred to as the C word. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, you know, we've worked very hard with over the years is helping the local church to change their mindset around as a Christian, we're going to have to make a determination who gets the capital C. Does cancer get the capital C or does Christ get the capital C? And Good so point. with that, uh, he said that he was the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And so there was a mindset and a paradigm shift how we were conditioned to see cancer as a fatal disease, as one that uh, people died from, uh, the malady of our day, et cetera, et cetera. And the fact of the matter is that that's not true, but we needed to begin to help educate the local church 
uh, that again, cancer is in many cases beatable, treatable, and survivable. And when we include the faith dynamic with good clinical care, uh, we actually can see some pretty amazing things that can take place with the cancer journey. Uh, does the church need to be actively involved in some kind of a, of a chaplaincy? I know a lot of churches have hospital visitation. Somebody from the congregation will go out and visit the, visit the sick. But do they need to be involved, already involved, and understand uh, that kind of the, the hospital ministry and how to motivate around a hospital and, and be part of a chaplaincy? Or can they just start from ground zero? We want to begin to minister to people that have cancer. They can start from ground zero. And it's one of the reasons why we started and created the Our Journey of Hope Cancer Care and Leadership Training Program. The program is designed to take the laity of a local church and begin to instruct and incorporate principles that we've already uh, understood and learned at the bedside as chaplains. And we put that in a, a didactic format that can be taught and transferred to anyone inside of the local church who has a heart and a passion and a desire to fulfill Matthew 25, a uh, clothe the naked, feed the hungry, and take care and visit them that are sick. At the end of the day, we have a biblical mandate to do just that, and it doesn't require a formal education per se mm -hmm. to begin to move and launch out in that direction. Just needs to have a framework and an understanding of what some of those practical principles and needs are and begin to start working and moving in that direction. In a moment, I want to ask Percy the question no one wants to ask. When is it okay to tell someone battling cancer that it's okay to go home? That in a moment. As the climate in our world grows more hostile toward our Christian worldview, Viewpoint is a program designed to help defend our faith. Each week, Bob Placey interviews guests who bring the Bible into focus. And we can be salt and light in this culture. Every description of Babylon in this book is going to come to pass. Helping us understand how relevant God's Word is for today. Viewpoint is completely viewer supported. If you've enjoyed and benefited from our interviews, we would ask you to consider helping us by supporting it financially. Your 20, 50, or even $100 monthly gift will help us continue to bring you more of these programs. Go to WTLW.com now and click Get Involved or you can send a check to the address on your screen. Thank you for supporting Viewpoint. TV44 created Viewpoint with Bob Placey to let everyone know that the Bible is still relevant today. Viewpoint is not only available on TV44's powerful broadcast stations and cable systems covering Northwest Ohio, but additionally, anyone can watch programs and exclusive bonus features on YouTube. And we've expanded Viewpoint's reach as you can now listen at work or in your car on the Viewpoint with Bob Placey podcast. Would you like to help expand our reach? Then sign into YouTube with your account and subscribe. Do the same on your favorite podcast app. By subscribing, rating, and sharing Viewpoint content, you will help this life-changing media show up on more search engines as popular and trending. If everyone watching right now could do that, Viewpoint would become more visible worldwide to online viewers in places even missionaries can't reach. Help us today reach the world. Share Viewpoint with Bob Placey today. Uh, Percy, what is a, a, the Journey of Hope training? I mean, for a church that's, uh, I don't know, maybe got a couple hundred members, what does that training look like? What's the mechanics of, of you people coming in and training them? And uh, what will it involve during the training and, and after the training? What's their commitment to this? It's very simple. The Our Journey of Hope Cancer Care Leadership Training Program is designed from a mechanical perspective to take two individuals from a local church and uh, equip them with a two free day seminar virtual training mm -hmm. with, with curr uh, curriculum, downloadable resources that they can take back to their local congregation and begin to recruit volunteers. Wow. Okay. Just like any other ministry inside of the local church mm -hmm. of individuals who show a desire and an interest, it certainly would not hurt if individuals may have had a cancer journey or may have supported cancer patients mm -hmm. or maybe even have worked in the healthcare environment, but not required. Okay. And then that leader of that, of that group then will begin to orient them with uh, a training manual that we provide that will step them through eight chapters 
that will equip individuals to begin starting practical cancer care ministry inside of their local church. We provide the PowerPoint templates, the announcements, the bulletins, everything that they will need to launch this inside of their local church. We provide the tools and the resources for them to then recruit and equip and then empower individuals to reach out and start building relationships with individuals within their congregation and outside of their congregation who may be on a journey of cancer. So it's not just them going into the hospital and, and making a visitation call on somebody from their church, but it's families that are in that church that uh, someone in that family has cancer and they've gone through uh, trying to assess the needs of that family and, and how they can minister to that family and how they can keep that family involved in that church rather than just hospital visits. Is that right? That is, that is absolutely correct. So this is about uh, developing and creating uh, a group of individuals who will have a rapport and relationship with the cancer patient, with their caregivers, with their family. Again, the local congregation is a family. Mm -hmm. Cancer is not an individual sport. <laughs> cancer, when it impacts people, it impacts everyone around them in their community. But unfortunately, the community has not been equipped to be able to rally effectively beyond offering a meal or just going to a hospital. Mm -hmm in terms of the entire mental, emotional, and certainly spiritual dynamics that cancer patients and their caregivers require and need. As a matter of fact, we have a complete chapter dedicated to supporting, caring for the caregivers, how mm -hmm. to support a caregiver who's supporting a cancer patient. Absolutely. Well, let's, let's dial in a little deeper right now. Uh, you've never personally were, were touched by cancer until, what, 18 months ago? That and is correct. Tell me, tell me on there's for cancer patients. I think there's always the day yeah. they're waiting for the phone call or they hear from their doctor. They go into the office and they get that, that news. What was that day like for you? Well, I knew that I had some symptoms and some things that were irregular with regard to um, uh, some function within my physical being had a colonoscopy. Uh, again, I've been doing this a long time, so I know the signs, the symptoms, and I know some of the dynamics. And I, I thought that probably I might get that news. Mm -hmm. And when I did, uh, of course, it was a moment of truth. And as I tell many people, I had to come to terms with it. Today, instead of being the guy that talks the walk of cancer, I now have to become the guy that's going to walk the talk. I'm part of the group now. I'm part of the team. And I counted it as a privilege. And I kind of reconciled myself to the fact that if I'm going to really talk about cancer and support cancer patients, well, I guess I probably now are going to have to walk this journey and be authentic and genuine from that perspective. You are the, you are the one who ministers to them, and now, now you're, you're one of them. That is correct. Was there anything in particular that you can remember that you said to God that day or soon after that when you thought, okay, this, this could be devastating or it could be a journey where I learn a lot? Well, the, the, the core thing that I said to the Lord was, Lord, here am I, send me. I have preached, I have talked, I have done interviews, I've done exactly what we're doing now for multiple years. Today I get to stand in that place and join arms with and, and genuinely be able to say to a cancer patient, I now know how you feel. Mm -hmm. Because unless you've walked in their moccasin, you should not and you cannot make that statement yeah. with a cancer patient. And I looked at that as an opportunity of extending and establishing even further the legitimacy of the ministry that God called me to over 20 plus years ago. Yeah. It's tough to say to somebody, I understand when you really have not been there, but uh, did, did God surprise you with anything during that, during that time? I, I don't know how long that period was that you were under treatment, but uh, uh, did God surprise you with anything that he was saying to you or, or doing with you or uh, in this personal battle with cancer? No, there really were no surprises. You know, I, I received the diagnosis. I then had uh, surgery. I was diagnosed with early stage uh, one colon cancer. I had a third of my colon removed. I tell people just call me Reverend Semicolon so we can kind of bring some levity to the moment. And uh, I've not received chemotherapy or radiation. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a very early uh, prognosis and diagnosis that suggested uh, that I should have a long and healthy life. Uh, I go back every three months to receive reevaluation. But the thing that God just continues to reinforce in me is growing up on the far south side of Chicago, I had to learn how to fight my way back and from school every day 
And today I get to live out the life of being a cancer fighter. Yep. And, and I truly began to understand why I was called to this ministry because I understood the power of the spirit of fight from a spiritual mm -hmm. perspective. Because all cancer patients have to learn how to be fighters yeah. and fight back. And you understand that now as, as, a, as a cancer patient, as a cancer survivor, uh, did it change in any way how you minister to, to, to cancer patients, how you, how you interact with them or how you develop your relationship with them? It just deepened my compassion and my empathy and, and my respect and appreciation. Cancer patients are some of the most courageous uh, people on planet Earth. And until you've actually been there and seen what they have seen and felt what they have felt, you don't understand the depth that is required that they must dig in order to, to be an overcomer and in order to provide a sense of, of hope and a sense of what do I do now next? And so all it did was just further that and, it, and elongate that and give me a greater sense of appreciation and value for who this community is that I now am a member of. Mm -hmm. Well, you had mentioned uh, the caregivers. And as we go back into the church again and how they can, how can they minister to those people that have been, have been the caregivers in the home that uh, uh, live the daily life with that patient? And uh, sometimes life can feel really overwhelming. How, does it, how will the church minister to those people? Well, first of all, we need to remember that in some cases, the caregiver may be mentally and emotionally more sick than the actual cancer patient. Uh -huh. that, they are, that they are struggling in many cases with their own fears, their own doubts, their own questions, in some cases a lack of faith, trying to still be strong and be a provider, but are working through their own uh, struggles and issues. So do not forget that the caregivers may very well be having their own struggles and issues sure. uh, as a result of being called into a ministry that they were never equipped for or prepared for. Right. They, they, this is something that, that life has brought into, in, into them, and, and now they've got to deal with it. What about uh, a long-term, somebody that's been struggling a long time uh, in, in cancer, they finally pass away, yep. and you've got this caregiver who now... Uh, life is almost feels empty because they've been doing all of this work, they've been giving all of this care, and uh, uh, they're exhausted, and now life is entirely different. How do you reach back into that life? Yeah, first of all, we need to remember that the caregivers uh, need to be ministered to, and they need to be given room to be human. I think particularly from a faith perspective, sometimes it, uh, with a lot of our grandiose ideology from a spiritual perspective, which is proper in its context, that these people have just gone through an amazing and tremendous loss mm -hmm. and struggle. They are mentally and emotionally and physically spent. And we need to allow them time to decompress and allow them to be human. They may say things, they may express things that may not sound very godly or very spiritual, uh, but we need to give them space to be able to decompress and simply begin to put into perspective what has happened. And that won't happen overnight. It will take time mm -hmm. and it will take patience and it will take the ability not to judge them. First principle with uh, supporting caregivers is do not judge cancer patients or caregivers. They are going and have gone through a tremendous mental and emotional and physical exercise that until you have walked in their moccasins, you have no idea the stress, the strain, and the turmoil of what they have worked through. And they need time to decompress and unpack that. Absolutely. And how have, they, how have these people, I mean, they're, they're going through all this, and especially those that are believers, they're going through this with maybe a great deal of faith, and they see God move. How have they ministered to you? Oh, uh, I, I used the perfect example what, about a year and a half ago or two years ago. Tony Evans is a perfect example mm -hmm. whose wife just passed away from, or, or did pass away from cancer. And they were very public. Mm -hmm. They were very vocal. Uh, they talked about, you know, almost on a monthly basis, the process and the progress. What I learned and took from that was the courage to be transparent and to allow that to be played out in front of others. Because at the end of the day, our spiritual leaders, we look to them for inspiration. Mm -hmm. We look to them for a sense of hope and direction. And they did that and still remained human while still serving God and working through this process. So I'm encouraged by anyone and particularly faith leaders who allow us to look into their journey and their process. And it's one of the reasons why I went public 
with my diagnosis and disease. If you did not know that I had cancer, you would never know that I was going through that process. But people need to hear the story and see individuals who are walking that path and are living a victorious life in terms of mentally, emotionally, and physically uh, moving day to day and still glorifying God in the midst of that process. Well, you've uh, evidently seen a broad spectrum of, of uh, belief in, 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 the, in the patients that you minister to. I mean, a wide range of everything from atheists to, to pastors. I mean, you've That's seen right. it all. How important is, and when you look at patients, how important is faith to them in their battle against this, against this, uh, this disease? How, how important is faith as they, as they continue to fight? Well, faith is probably the most crucial component and X factor. And you're right. I've ministered to Muslims and atheists and anything in between, Wiccan witches, you name it. I have seen it and I've stood before those individuals. And what I have come to understand, even for people who may share uh, or embrace a spiritual orientation that may not be germane to a Christian theology, is the idea and the thought that there is some other force of power beyond me that I may be able to tap into, that that provides a sense of hope and possibility. Now, of course, when we dial back into our Christian faith, we know that we then tap into the power of the Holy Spirit and, and God's anointing and et cetera. But the, the dynamic of faith creates a mental and emotional sense of possibility that in many cases outside of that arena, people cannot tap into, nor can they self-manage. Spirituality and faith can be self-managed. We don't need anyone's permission to do that. We don't need a prescription. We don't need a doctor's order. We can do as much or little of that that we want to regulate as it empowers us or makes a difference in our lives. And that is a huge mechanism that cancer patients draw upon because they realize that that is something that they can titrate while they're driving their bus. Right. You'd, you'd mentioned Tony, Tony Evans' wife and, and how she passed away with cancer. Is there a, is there a time, a point where it's okay, uh, somebody's been battling for a long time, and I, I had a friend that was battling for a long time. Is there a point where they are exhausted? They're, they're, they're tired of the fight. Is there a point where you, you, you look at them and you say, it, it's okay? It's, it, you're, you're not a coward if, 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 you're, if you're ready to go home. You're not a coward. It's, it's okay to give up the fight, surrender, and, and go home. Absolutely. And it's one of the biggest misnomers among Christian <laughs> theology, uh, depending on what our <laughs> theological camp is, word of faith and faith healing and so on and so forth. There becomes a time and place that we must come to terms with and say, and look a patient in the eye and give them permission. I've actually had to do this on many occasions and say that if you're ready to go, if you're tired and if you have nothing left, it's okay if you've made resolution and peace in your heart with your family, your friends, and more importantly, with God, it is certainly okay because we all cheated and read the end of the book. We know where we're going. We know where we're heading. And Paul said it best, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I've run a good race. I've fought a good fight. And now I am ready to be offered up. So there can be a legitimate time and place to help people walk that path with the dignity mm -hmm. and self-respect and certainly never, ever judge those individuals to say that they were lacking faith or they gave up on their faith. It is the most unfair thing to do to believers, and I've seen it happen a lot. Yeah, I've seen where, where in, in my own life, people that I've, that I've been with, where they needed permission to die. They were going to continue to fight and fight and fight because they didn't feel like they had permission to die. Well, is, here's a principle for you that, I, that an old bedside chaplain can tell you, mm -hmm. and that is this, that death and dying is typically not difficult for the patient, but it's difficult for the people that they have to Absolutely. leave behind. Absolutely. And they typically fight and hold on for others, in many cases, more than they do for themselves. Mm -hmm. It's an important principle to know. Yeah. You've been doing a, a podcast for quite a while now, Health, Hope, and Inspiration, I think well over 200 and probably 250 episodes now, yep. which is a lot of extra work. But why has that become so important? I, I watch it on YouTube. Why has it become so important to you to do that? And why is it important to the, to the, the, the patients themselves and their families? Well, this is another benefit of over 20 years ago saying yes to God about a ministry that I did not understand, nor that I was consciously aware of. 
thought I was going to move in a different direction. Uh, once we really got a sense of uh, our grounding and momentum with the, our journey at folk training program, uh, another principle that I've learned over the years is that cancer patients all have stories to tell. They all have a story to tell. And in many cases, they find it difficult to find individuals who will listen to their story. But over the years, what I've also come to understand is that because there are now so many more people who are being diagnosed with cancer and people who are walking the journey of cancer, they want to hear stories about cancer patients, particularly when they have had success. So we have just simply married and merged those two audiences together. Health, Hope, and Inspiration is a podcast that allows cancer patients, caregivers, their clinical doctors, nutritionists, and anyone that's part of the cancer continuum to talk about uh, the dynamic of cancer within the context of medicine and science and faith and spirituality and how those two worlds can be amalgamated together to potentially cre create an opportunity for people to move successfully through a process of cancer and treatment of it. Well, I know there's a lot of churches out there that uh, as they watch this, they're going to say, uh, or at least people in churches, they say, I, how do I get involved? How can I get my church? I mean, we right now you're doing everything on, on a virtual basis. How, how do they get involved in that? And, and what's, uh, you already mentioned it, there's no cost to them. So what, what's their next step if they, if they want to get involved in the journey of hope? So our journey of hope is absolutely, all of the curriculum is free. Please go to our journey of hope. Dot com. All one word, all lowercase letters, our journey, not your, not they, not a, our journey of hope.com. And that'll take you to our website. You can find our registration page where we have all of our trainings that have been scheduled. And then you can register online uh, free of charge and you can attend virtually any training free of charge. So we have several that have been scheduled throughout the rest of the year. For those who are interested in tapping into Health, Hope, and Inspiration, the podcast, you can go to healthhopeandinspiration.com. And that is the website for uh, the podcast. And we have free resources that you can download that talks about relevant subject matter to cancer patients from a faith-based perspective. So ourjourneyofhope.com and healthhopeandinspiration.com. Well, I've seen them both, and, and there are, there's a wealth of information there for churches and individuals. So, Percy, thanks for all of your work and all that you've sown into this ministry. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you. Bless you. Continue to go and do good work. We've got uh, work to do, so let's keep chopping the wood. Absolutely. Thank you. Right. God bless. If there's anything we can pray about for you and your family, connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and on our website at WTLW.com. I'm Bob Placey, thanks for joining me. Remember, you can watch the interviews you've seen today on demand on YouTube. Plus, you can also listen to all of our episodes on the Viewpoint with Bob Placey podcast on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you listen to a podcast.